If you want to see the entire chat with Jeremy Kaufman, you got to go to one of my other platforms that have not recently suspended me. The links are in the description. Mozilla investigation is shows YouTube algorithm recommends videos that violate the platform's very own policies. And then it's just another one of those studies that basically says there's all this misinformation out there. How, you know, how do they categorize that or who's making the decisions? Uh, we have no clue. It also has like really stupid things here. Like recommended videos were 40% times more likely to be regretted than video search for what is 40% more times. I don't even know what that means. Um, but, you know, so I think these these studies are pretty stupid, but I do think that when they come out, you know, if they're produced by some big corporate organization that and, and I don't even I'm, I'm sure they're all kind of working together. So I don't even know if Mozilla is really that different from, you know, Google that's not different from YouTube or or if it even matters in that sense. But but anytime I feel like there's pressure from Congress or from these studies or, um, you know, other corporations for a crackdown on misinformation that we see more of that. I'm curious, have you noticed any more? Like, have you noticed creators talking about that more? Do you feel like there's been an escalation in, um, you know, strikes and suspensions specifically, I guess, even related to to COVID or maybe, I don't know, extremism in general. Um, what and, and what, you know, if you do, do you have any thoughts on like where that's coming from? Yeah, uh, that's there's a lot to respond to there because I have a lot of thoughts. <laughs> uh, so we'll see if I can keep them coherent. Um, I mean, so first is this like this general concept of, of quote, misinformation. Like I almost want to adopt other other terms because I feel like you're, we're almost seeding ground in the way that we talk about it because it's kind of a ludicrous standard. So first mm -hmm. of all, you know, when we're talking about like novel medical things like there's no consensus that's not how science works uh, and i'm i have a science background i in addition to studying computer science i studied physics i've been involved i was involved in the scientific community and it's like that's not how it works science means you can criticize anything science means that there can be a 99.5 consensus and that consensus can be wrong as is true throughout history you have dozens of examples you know plate tectonics how ulcers formed you know all kinds of things where everyone knew the truth and it turned out the truth was wrong so if we're going to say that we're a pro science platform that means people are allowed to say just about anything. The standard being um, enforced on YouTube is absolutely ludicrous. You have licensed medical doctors who are giving their medical opinions, who there's the, the AMA is not taking their license away over what they're saying. They're fully within bounds in, in, as far as the people who license doctors. What they're saying is completely okay. The standard to publish to YouTube for medical information is higher than the standard to practice medicine. I mean, and that's just completely ludicrous. And then this misinformation, it's applied incredibly selectively. Um, I think there's misinformation about economics. It's called communism. There's not an idea that is, is probably more disproven as a, as, a, as a good economic system than communism. You can be a college professor. You can work in government. You can make videos about it. So why is this? And it's far more harmful misinformation. Look at what, look at what happened to Cuba. Look at what this misinformation did to Cuba. That is far more dangerous misinformation than misinformation about vaccines, even if I'm accepting this misinformation, I don't know, it depends on what we're talking about. But so it's like, it's a complete double standard. And what and so this gets into why it's happening. And this, I think, is trickier to evaluate. Um, it's possible that it is this government influence. We've seen um, the government was very involved in the in the censoring of 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 Trump, uh, where there's active communication between um, the Biden administration and Facebook. Um, and other other communications between uh, government or soon to be government officials and the social media platforms. Another thing I think that goes on though is simply that these institutions, I'm sorry, these companies are largely ideologically uh, homogenous. And when you have ideological homogeny, then like things that are like, and especially as we move to this sort of like two movies uh, reality where people are just experiencing the world completely differently, what feels normal and acceptable to them, like it just feels okay because they're all on the same page they're you know it's something like 20 plus to one you know donors to democrats versus republicans and so they're going to develop uh, among employees at google and so they're going to develop like incredible biases in terms of how they see the world because they're all reinforcing their worldview so i think that it's it can both be a government driven thing i also think this sort of like this this ideological uh, homogeny among the people who work there. I think that plays a role. And I'm sure there's other factors as well uh, uh, that play a role as well. It's a, it's a complex phenomenon. Since you 
run one of these companies, not to associate with you with YouTube, but a platform for creators. I'm curious and in, in, in sort of like how it works in the uh, behind the scenes, because more and more it's starting to seem obvious that AI is making a lot of the decisions, not just about, um, you know, your strike, but even your appeal. Like, it just seems like it's not even a real person anymore. And so even if you're appealing it, it's it's not, I don't know. I mean, maybe I'm wrong here, but um, I'm, I'm curious. So when you're saying that you have this ideological homogeneity, how does that then get expressed in the machine learning? Like, how does it get expressed, I guess, in the way that that YouTube, for instance, um, even if it's not a real person that's looking at my appeal, is is figuring out whether I should win my appeal about my suspension? And, and, and um, you know, is there then any way to fight back? Like, if, if you're really, you know, you're just working against robots at this point, um, you know, because like, it seems like even worse, like, if it's, it's a human with, uh, you know, a, a majoritarian position, but maybe at least you can use logic and argue with them. But if they've written into code where a machine is just making the decision for you, like, is there any hope? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, in our case specifically, it's, it's still good old fashioned humans. And we're also, you know, much more um, inclusive than, than YouTube would, would be uh, in terms of what's, uh, in terms of what's allowed in terms of what goes on at, at these sites. I mean, um, algorithms are written by humans. Uh, and is, so it is true that humans will reinforce their own preferences and bias, biases through the algorithms that they, you know, write and create. Like if, and if we're talking about like AI specifically, like the way that a lot of this is done is they're given training data and training models. And so like, there's this huge set of data where they're saying these videos broke these rules and those determinations were made by humans. And then they go to the computers and they say, learn from these examples and attempt to produce outcomes that would match them. So a common way that you um, even build these algorithms, right, is you take a set of data. So suppose YouTube has a million moderation decisions that were made by humans. What you do is you take 500,000 of them, uh, you split them in half, It's not always in half, but you split them into two portions, let's say halves. You take 500,000 of them and you, you you tell you have the um, you have these algorithms that actually iteratively uh, attempt to find um, a solution that will generate the right outcomes to match the other half. So these AI algorithms are are literally designed to match the behavior that was done by the human. So if the humans have um, you know biases in the way that they're enforcing. Uh, the rules; those biases are going to be reinforced by the AI algorithm. Now, as opposed to, now as, as to what you do about it, uh, you come onto Odyssey, of course. I mean, that's like the obvious answer. I don't know. Um, I don't know what else you can do to you know, to sort of fight Google. I mean, Google is still a profit-driven corporation. I imagine if they continue to lose more money doing these things, they they might change their behavior. Yeah, I I don't know. I I doubt it. I I don't yeah. think they're gonna, they'll ever lose enough money. And um and I also think there's a power side of all of this that that yeah. even perhaps supersedes the finances. Um, I agree. Okay. And you well, you that, could see uh, they they lost a bunch of money when they banned Trump. Like the the stock prices went down. So I I do agree that there is um yeah. an ideological or power side of it as well. Well, and like somebody brought up the other day, how if news, for instance, was all really just about ratings, then we would have seen Jeffrey Epstein, you know, nonstop because people yeah. are very interested in that topic. There's a reason why we weren't talking about him. Yeah. Um. And I and I can affirm that as somebody that that worked in mainstream news, that there's a yeah, there's a moral crusading to the position, and again, the same kind of ideological homogeneity. And so, um, you know, you believe you're doing something, something, um, you know, extremely uh, heroic for the public when you block information from them. You know, you, you, that's where that whole gatekeeper term <laughs> came from. So, so, and and so, a lot of you know, there, that, there's, I would say, the average you know, uncritically thinking journalist is more on that end than the money side of thing. Cause the, the regular journalist is not sitting there thinking, um, Oh, how can I make a ton of money? Cause they get their salary regardless of what the ratings are, or what the, the corporation is bringing in. Um, you know, they're more or less sitting there thinking like, what is my moral duty? And unfortunately that, that combined with, uh, you know, thinking not very critically about the world around them and, you know, just having that posture, I guess, of, of like, I know what's best for people. 
that's how you end up with the news that that you get. Not not to say that finances is not part of it, um, because it's, it, it sets up a system where where even the best meeting journalists don't have time to really think about what they're doing anyway. So it's like it keeps you in this, you know, this sort of intellectual prison. But um, I do think that there's a whole another level of sort of like ego and power and narcissism that plays into all of this that that is that's, um, you know, exclusive from the from the finances. OK, um, so if I I'm cutting this from YouTube. OK, so everybody, if you want to watch the rest of this, you got to go to Odyssey. Um, my other platforms links are in the description. But the next thing we're going to talk about, Jeremy, and again, you got to go to the other platforms to see him. Go over to Odyssey. You have become a little bit of a rabble rouser on Twitter. rabble. <laughs> and, okay. and everyone should just see this is what before you started fighting the federal government, this is what your beard used to look like. I'm going to just do a full screen here. This is oh, what his beard boy. looks like. Today. Yeah. Yeah. I th I'm thinking I'm not going to cut it until my battle with the government is over so I can have this, you know, physical re um, <laughs> representation of it. I don't know. Yeah. It's the longest my beard has ever been. Uh, yeah. I mean, so these I will say like. I, you know, uh, I'm relatively ideological libertarian. Anyone who who, who sees my posts will not. Um, uh, we'll figure that out relatively uh, relatively quickly. Um, uh, and you know, I so I'm a free speech guy at my company, and um, free so that's part of why I want to um, enable things. I'm I'm enthusiastic about enabling things that I completely disagree with. I said communist, uh, you know, economics is misinformation, but I'm not going to ban that stuff, right? It's completely, um, completely okay. I'm not going to write algorithms against it, you know, because I think that I, I, I truly want to be as neutral as possible. Um, but I also believe that like, I think this, this cultural trend of, of, you know, making companies responsible for you know, individuals at the company behavior. I think that's all wrong. Um, and so, you know, I'm, I'm pretty bo like bold and out there with my, um, with my personal, uh, with my personal opinions. Um, and if, it, and, uh, so like, yeah, those are, you know, those are, those are separate things. Um, you know, what I, you know, what I believe. Um, but yeah, I'm, uh, uh, I, I actually live in New Hampshire as part of something called the free state project, um, which is this idea that libertarians can win by, physically concentrating in a state and and sort of uh, exerting extra influence, you know, maybe taking it over. Uh, it seems to be working. Um, we've gotten a bunch of people elected up here, uh, just cut taxes, cu cut taxes and cut spending, which I don't think happens in very many uh, states. You know, we got rid of critical race theory and, and all this other stuff that I think is, um, you know, pretty positive. But that's all me personally. And I do try to keep those things separate from, um, you know, the the work. Your pin tweet here is for all the journos now following me. Please be clear in your reporting that I was 100% radicalized by NPR. And you do <laughs> kind of stick it to the media a lot. Give us a little bit of uh, your thoughts on what, you know, not just, I guess, generally speaking, what we're seeing with media coverage of, of, um, the speech you're discussing, like of the, you know, radical information or their disinformation. Because I, I, it just drives me nuts. Yeah. I, I feel like they're constantly pushing for a crack, more and more crackdowns on it. Like they're part of of the problem. Um, but also, have you seen them specifically covering your um, oh. you know, Odyssey and your case and everything? And how are they doing with that? Yeah, and NPR finally covered my case. And it's funny because NPR had not covered my case when I started this um, tweet <laughs> series. And, and they did precisely the job that I would you know, expect. They make it about we're enabling right-wing extremism, you know, ignoring the fact that we have a roster of popular science creators in the hundreds, ignoring the fact that you know there are um, there are people in in China and Taiwan and Taiwan that are using the platform in their fight for freedom. You know that there are um, you know that there's just so much stuff. There's so many finance videos, blockchain videos. I mean, it is not um, in any way this this platform that's like you know just this narrow ideology. You find so many things, and they drill and, and they find the one thing. I mean, the, same thing with the New York Times covered us. They you know they managed to find one guy with 300 followers, and they're like, but the site also hosts. And it's like that's like point zero zero one percent. You know, it's probably more zeros than that of, of the way it's being used. And and this is this is the game that they play. Mm -hmm. um, so I have a very low opinion of of most of the the corporate press or uh, the legacy media is a new term I've been uh, I've been using. Um, they've done it to me personally, and I just I mean this does get into that that Scott Adams idea of like this two movies reality where it's like we can literally like it's just so divergent the way that we you know see the world. Um, mm -hmm. I mean I don't know how someone could observe 
the way that the press acted over the last 12 to 18 months, the massive hypocrisy in between how they cover something like, um, you know, uh, BLM related riots and a riot at the Capitol um, or things like this and not see them as incredibly biased. Um, some people managed to see it. Um, it's weird for me. This tweet's entirely accurate. I came from the left. Like I was an NPR listener um, and uh, like my social views are probably still like relatively um, progressive, but I, I consider myself now like if on, in terms of the left, right, I think I'd be on the right. Um, and part of it absolutely was like, you know, waking up and seeing the fact that like, they're just lying to me. They're just manipulating me. Um, I, whether it's overt or like their own subjective biases that they don't realize, like, uh, you know, I have, I have a very low opinion of them at this point. So this tweet that I was showing just heard a disinformation yeah. reporter on NPR report that crisis, it, the crisis, I'm guessing, of disinformation could take 50 <laughs> yeah. years to resolve and require a total redesign of the Internet because information moves too freely. Yeah, they all seem to be extremely concerned uh, about that. <laughs> yeah, that's that's another part that's so weird for me because and I grew up, I, you know, sort of coming of age for me was the 1990s. And and there there. I do think the right wing had more social power at the time. You know, you had, you know, religious conservatives, you know, wanting to ban, you know, you know, they're fighting over rap music and and things like this. And where I was like, you know, squarely against those things. Hey, we, we should be allowed to sing what they want to sing, be able to make music how they want to make it. And you'd had, you know, the Dixie Chicks got canceled, you know, over their comments over the Iraq war. So like there was a time when the sort of power was flipped, but I now it's, I, it's flipped completely. And I think this is what a part of like, made me turn against them because it was clear that like these weren't principles for them like to me you know, freedom of speech free free expression that is a principle and i'm going to hold that even if i disagree with you and it's like it's oh what's the what's the what's the dune quote it's like um um i i ask you to follow uh when i'm not in power i ask you to follow your principles because it's good for me and then it's like when i'm in power i don't abide them because i screwed up the quote um but then, <laughs> <I'll do that. laughs> you know it's like it's this complete flip of uh you know now they are in uh, uh, power, and those their 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 principles weren't real. They weren't genuine, and now they're interested in canceling, and now they're interested in you know they don't care about freedom of speech. They don't care about um, people being able to talk. You know they, these things have to be scrubbed from the internet, and to see journalists of all people you know calling for people to be deplatformed and to be censored, um, it's it's yeah it's 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 really it's really crazy. Uh, when I am weaker than you, I ask you for freedom because that is according to your principles. When I'm stronger than you, I take away your freedom because that is according to my principles. Yeah, that's the quote. Yeah. I love wine. And my favorite kind of wine is a high altitude Argentinian Malbec. And now you can get 50% off some of my favorite bottles and 50% off shipping by visiting allisonwinepromo.com. That's allison with one L, winepromo.com. These wines come from one of the most isolated winemaking regions in the world with the Andes Mountains on one side and desert on the other. One of the Malbecs is from the third highest vineyard in the world at 8,950 feet. The reason I love these wines is the altitude means that the UV rays beating down on the grapes is making them work harder. And doctors I talk to say they have higher antioxidant properties. Again, it's allisonwinepromo.com, allison with one L, winepromo.com.